So, no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're thinking, turns out that you're using a large part of your brain. Uh, this is uh, what your brain looks like and the connections during a resting state. Now, cells in, in your brain are talking to other cells in parts of other parts of your brain over very large regions like this with the connections you can see over very small regions like this. And the connections, who's talking to whom, changes over millisecond time scales. Uh, cells that are talking to one another at any given time and synchronizing, coordinating their activity are called cell assemblies. It's not clear how all of these different conversations are coordinated with one another because there isn't any conductor. On the other hand, uh, there is coordination and the brain produces a multitude of different so-called rhythms or oscillations which among them um, turn out to coordinate and time and synchronize every thought and every action. Those rhythms are at uh, a multiple of time scales. They go from about one hertz up to maybe about 200 or 250 hertz. And uh, to compare, middle C is about 260 hertz. So these are a little below middle C. And your electrical activity in your home is 60 hertz smack in the middle of all of this. Scientists can measure these brain rhythms in many different ways. You can measure them, you can measure them non-invasively, you can measure them um, within invasively in animals, you can even measure them in brain slices, and occasionally you can even see them in individual neurons. Now, just like in orchestras, there are many rhythms that happen all at once. This is an example of what happens during working memory, and you can see different networks for each of the different uh, rhythms. There's a gamma rhythm, 30 to 90 hertz, which is thought to be important for helping to create cell assemblies. There is a beta rhythm, which is important in coordinating long distance, involved in making decisions like what to eat or not eat. Um, there's the alpha rhythms, which seem to be important when you want to actively ignore something you don't want to pay attention to. And all of these are happening at the same time. It's very important in brain rhythms that cells be more or less on the same wavelength if they want to talk to one another. So if cells are, are not on the same wavelength, they may not be able to hear what is being said to them. And this turns out to be very important in a whole lot of neurological diseases, um, including Parkinson's disease and uh, schizophrenia and depression and autism, and also in anesthesia. Uh, this is showing here that uh, we may not know what consciousness is, but we definitely know when it isn't there. Uh, and you can tell by brain rhythms instantly uh, how deep somebody is into anesthesia. In addition, um, some kind of treatments like deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease actually seem to work by making the rhythms go back to what they're supposed to be. And finally, um, look, um, in order to study brain rhythms, it's really important to be able to look at everything from um, what's going on um, physiologically to what's going on um, in function. And my part of this is to work with uh, mathematical modeling to understand how you get from one to the other. Thank you. Thank you. Well, stay there, please. Oh, do, stay there. do stay there. Thank you. So, so I have a really basic question, which is, how do all these rhythms get established and maintained if there's no conductor? Ha ha. Well, this is a little like asking what consciousness is. Oh. And it's about as deep as that. 
So in my work, what I try to do is first understand how different parts of the brain can produce all of these different rhythms in small little bits of tissue, how um, they coordinate with one another, which is why one needs those, whoops, differential equations there. Uh, and then how those rhythms act to process the information or signals that's coming from one part of a brain to the other part of the brain. And the big, big question is to understand how all of these things fit together to create um, sensory processing, uh, motor choices, decisions, memory, learning. Um, it's the Wild West. And we're <laughs> right at the beginning in understanding how all of these rhythms play a role in doing this. Thank you. A question here. Do we have any idea if you're under anesthesia, if you really don't remember what happened? Um, it's a very good question. Um, there are many things in anesthesia. Uh, there, the patients are given cocktails of anesthetics, one part of which is an amnesiac. So in fact, there are times when patients can remember what, they, what happened to them during anesthetics and lawsuits ensue. So people work very hard on figuring out how to make that cocktail so that you don't remember. Yeah, I'll remember that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is there any way of estimating, and if so, what's the result, how many different synchronized rhythms there might be in the brain in, uh, in function at any one time? Well, it depends on what you call a single rhythm. People used to talk about alpha or beta or gamma, and now it becomes clear that there are subgroups, subsets of all of those things, and they operate in somewhat different ways, and they can change um, almost instantly within a task. So there's a sense that at any given time, there are discrete bands, but exactly how to count all of these things is still open. Okay, thank you, please. What happens during meditation? What happens uh, during meditation? I love question. that question because I'm a meditator. Um, there are studies that show that alpha rhythms seem to be um, enhanced during that period of time, but we still don't know exactly what those alpha rhythms are doing. Um, it's clear from other physiological uh, experiments that have been done that uh, during meditation not only your brain rhythms change but the rest of your physiology also changes. Uh, what's the relationship between the changes you induce in your brain rhythm and the bodily changes outside your brain is to me a million dollar question. And I hope we understand it better. Thank you. Again. Uh, how do our rhythms compare to those in other animals? How could you say that again? How do our rhythms compare oh, yes. to those of other animals? Are we like other animals in this? Um, indeed, uh, brain rhythms have been shown to exist in basically everything that has a brain. So <laughs> certainly, um, dogs and cats and mammals. But, but also insects. Uh, in fact, insects are widely studied for uh, decision-making processes associated with their rhythms. I'm going to get one last question in, I hope. And that is, you mentioned that there are some kinds of intervention, deep brain stimulation, that can apparently reset rhythms. Are there any other ways of resetting rhythms? Um, transcranial magnetic stimulation can reset rhythms. But this is, this is the beginning. The, the, just the basic start of understanding how we can manipulate those things for therapeutic gain. We don't really know. We don't really know. Thank you very much. Thank you.